hey, this is Al. We're in the Arts Cafe. It's some of us, but it's really great. And uh, this is really exciting. It's 10.30 a.m. Philadelphia time. Many people watching this are ModPo regulars. You know how a webcast goes. For those of you who are new, rookies, you know, neophytes, uh, this is not going to be typical because we're actually going to be talking about two poems instead of a whole week of poems. Yes, it'll be interactive, but it'll be a little different from the regular symposium season webcasts, which are weekly. But we're very happy. And so what we're going to do today, after I give out the phone number, is we're going to go around for each. So each member of the crew here is going to say hello, but also to tell us very, very briefly, very briefly, a sentence or two, what you're working on, something you're working on, something you're doing job-wise or volunteer-wise or something you've written or created or I, I don't know, whatever, okay? This is a great way to start. Meantime, 610-616-3208 is the phone number. And remember, today we're talking about two poems. We're going to be starting with the Harriet Muller, Mullen Tonka Diary called Urban Tumbleweed. Uh, thanks, Zach. Well, you are on. <laughs> Zach turned right to this. Here it is. Um, we're going to start with that. So if you want to call and say hello only, that's fine. Oh, it'll, it'll be brief. Uh, but um, mostly what you'd like, we'd like you to do is ask a question about the Tonka Diary or respond to uh, what people are saying. Okay, 610-616-3208. You can also chat. And who, oh, nobody brought a laptop. <laughs> I can go back. I got it. Ah, Lainey's going to be looking at the YouTube chat. Okay, and Lily, who's got a phone, is going to be looking at Twitter, and the and the hashtag is Modpo Live, Modpo Live, L I V E at the end of that hashtag Modpo Live. So Lily's going to look at that. Lainey's going to look at the YouTube chat, and so here we go. We're going to start with Kinar. Kinar, what are you working on? What's going on? Quickly, two sentences. Sure. Sentence one, uh, I have a bunch of seedlings growing, uh, so my living room's kind of pink with the light from that, which is nice. Um, thing number two, I've been working a lot with this group called Chester Residents Concerned for Quality Living, or a circle. They're really great. Um, I suggest checking them out. They are fighting an incinerator in Chester, which is in Delaware County, like 12 miles from campus. So, yeah, that's what I'm up to. Thank you, Kinar, and hello to you. Hello. It's good to see you. Okay, Jason's up next. What are you working on? Two sentences followed by Davey. Um, I'm working on uh, a course for a thing called Modpo <laughs> Slowpo um, on the poetry of Jack Spicer. And um, we've got, this is the, the eighth day, and we've got a few more days to go. But as the as the forum discussions will be there ongoingly, if anyone wants to jump in at the last minute, we had someone jump in yesterday and, and come to a, a Zoom talk, a Zoom discussion. Um, you're welcome to, to join us. Thank you, Jason. I've been following it, and it's been great, right, Lainey? And it's, it's, there are it's a lot amazing. of people. People are so excited about yeah. Slopo yeah. right now and all the classes and it. People yeah. Are still signing? How many classes did we set up? Five. Five. Yeah. So. So I mean, it turns out that Slopo is a thing. I mean, it's yeah. really, really a thing. It it allows you to deal with you know one or two poets or a concept, um, and to, to take it easy, slow. Yeah. Okay. And if you want to join that, just write to modpo at writing and we'll add you to the list. But also, as Jason was implying, the forum, which you can find, it's a sub-forum, you can find it by going to Slopo in the main uh, list of forums, and then click Slopo, and then click the word all, and you'll see all the sub-forums, and then find the Spicer sub-forum. And it's true of all of them, you can go, and forever you'll be able to see a record of the discussion. In many cases, at least in my Slopo, I post the poems themselves, and so. Yay. Thank you, Jason. Davey, followed by Lily. Davey. Ow. <laughs> it is a joy. It's been a minute. To see Ow. you. It's so good. 
It's so nice Here to you see. are. This, this is, is such a natural Cafe. thing. That's bananas. I don't yes. think I've been in the Arts Cafe since I graduated. How yeah. weird. It is weird. Yeah. What are you working on? Uh, thing one, it is spring, which means it is picnic season in the park near my house, <laughs> which means that there are lots of leftover hot dogs, which means I'm working on getting my dog Hobbs to not eat them, which he'd like oh. to do. Le- hot dogs are not good for dogs. No. Despite the name. No. Despite the name and the... Yeah, he can smell one from like 50 feet away. So I'm working on getting him to not do that. Uh, it's not going very well. He's getting a lot of hot dogs. Uh, and two, I'm currently a postdoc at Princeton in architecture, which is very fun and requires a lot of translation because I'm not an architect. Uh, and I'm teaching a class called Race, Gender, and the Urban Environment, which is full of uh, senior undergraduate engineers. And they are teaching me a lot. And so I'm working on learning from and with them, which has been fun. Respecting no disciplinary boundaries, yeah. we have our <laughs> friend, Davey Niddle. Um, thank you, Davey. Lily, followed by Gabby. Okay, well, the most exciting ModPo-related thing I'm working on right now is getting ready to bring Caroline Bergvall to the Writer's House on uh, Monday and Tuesday of next week. Um, in our undergraduate seminar, we are discussing up a storm. Um, <laughs> we just talked about Allison Sings yesterday, and it was a really amazing conversation, I thought. Yes. Um, so if you're a ModPo person who is listening to the webcast today and you want to um, attend those virtual events, um, yeah, there's all kinds of ways you can find out about them, but you can write to me at whfellow at writing.upenn.edu. Thank you, Lily. Gabby, followed by Kate. Hey, hey. Um, good to be here. Um, I'm working on the long durée of my dissertation, which is probably going to be my answer for the next like two years and change. Wait, um, what? Say I, that again. I said I'm working on the long durée of my dissertation, which is going to be my answer oh, for the next two no, years. Oh, why mention the dissertation? <laughs> well, it's what I'm working on. I mean, I got to work on it. OK, all point. right. But the other thing that I'm doing is I did just put out a book last week, which I'm really happy about. Zach, Zach, um, Zach's, Zach is not <laughs> able to show a close up of the book. <laughs> I don't We're understand. doing a camera roll. <laughs> so I just put that out, and so I'm working okay, on it's all right. telling people about it. It's very exciting. It's called Madness, and when I get the screen on me, I will sh- I will show it. Congratulations, <laughs> Gabby. That thank, is so fabulous. Kate, followed by Amber Rose. Hey there. Um, Hi, Kate. (laughs) Hi. I've been working on a couple of books, one of poetry, one of prose. I've been working on some freelance copywriting. I have a slow po course on George Oppen coming up in May, and I hope lots of people will sign up for that. I'm really excited about that. And right now my kids are on spring break, so I'm not doing any of that. Oh, are they going to invade the space? Or have they, have they been no, trained I, to do so? I took great care to get rid of them this morning. <laughs> <laughs> There's a kind of hidden story in there. Is that when we were all visiting Providence, yes. yeah. we were in the middle of a video so filming, great. and they, were sne- yes. they sneaked in behind where Kate is sitting as if somehow... They wouldn't be seen on camera. Really hilarious. It's on YouTube. It's, it's on YouTube. You can see it. And we were all very cool. Kate was mortified. <laughs> like, I would ask her a question, and Kate was like, They were uh, standing right behind they were right me. There. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One's own children. Uh, Amber Rose Johnson, who has not just swallowed a bite of a peanut butter sandwich and therefore can speak. <laughs> Hello. Friends. I would like to say that I was here on time, but I was pursuing this peanut butter sandwich, which anyone who is a fan of ModPo knows if I'm here, snack. I'm snacking. <laughs> so happy to be with you and snacking away. You forgot what the prompt was. The oh, prompt what was, was the what, prompt? The, <laughs> what am I working on the, eating this sandwich? The prompt was what you're working on. Okay, I'm working on <laughs> um, consistent protein intake <laughs> with this peanut butter sandwich. And... Um, I'm also working on figuring out how to keep top-heavy plants upright. Oh, wow. You are really funny. <laughs> I'm in a silly mood You've just morning. gotten a certification. Will you tell us? I just got a... <laughs> I just got a Dynamic Sports Performance Coaching Certification. What's the acronym? 
DSPCC. Shout out DSP. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hashtag. DSPCC, DSPCC, getting strong, giving strength and study. It's all about the breath. There's a paper forthcoming about close reading kettlebell movements, but that's in the that's in the future. Oh, you are wild. But anyway, I'm a kettlebell coach, and okay. I was recently certified for sports performance training. And only when you receive that certification did your newest pupil step up and ask for a weekly session. Guess who I'm getting ready to start training. Wow. It's Al Philry's yes, friends. it's going to be oh so God. great. And me and Al, Kamara, listen. you must not be laughing, Kamar. Okay. We are getting our asses down to Atlanta, and we are going to teach you how to <laughs> listen, do it, too. Mago, I'm going to start bringing a kettlebell. We're just going to be doing deadlifts in between oh, our close reading I don't even sessions. know what a deadlift is, but I have a feeling I'm going to learn. Listen, anyway, you I took too much time just now. Poets. You've okay. just hogged right. the whole <laughs> Are we a little giddy? What Let's would they, Chris and Zach, what it would be like if each mod weekly regular symposium mode webcast were like this? We'd never get anything done. Forget the poets. Okay, it's time. To, it's time for Lainey Brown, followed by Kamara Brown. I am like Lily, super excited about Carolyn Bergvall's upcoming visit. Uh, all the flowering trees I see out the window and creating some new mod po content that's been happening lately. So be looking for that. We have new videos on the work of Sawako Nakayasu and Hua Nguyen. And I also have a new book about to burst into the world. Woo -woo. It's called Translation of the Lilies Back into Lists from Wave Books, and I'm doing a virtual launch at AWP Thursday and an in-person launch <laughs> in Philly Friday and more You gotta stop being so busy. Man, this is a productive group, holy cow. Also wanna shout out to Lainey for really, really doing a lot of the curation of the new videos, picking them, working with me on setting it up, inviting people. There's some great things. And very soon, I'll be putting out an announcement featuring all the new ones where they're in process. And thanks to Zach for doing a lot of video editing. We turn now, finally, to Kamara Brown. Welcome. Welcome back, Kamara. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. Nice to see everybody and hear everybody's voice. Um, uh, uh, what am I working on? I'm in a bit of a transition. So I'm working on actually moving. And that's been a whole situation <laughs> and um, a good situation overall. And then I talk about boring things to work on. I'm, I'm working a lot on my resumes, which like I resumes because <laughs> I'm applying to things and um, it's a whole, whole new world opening up to me. The genre of resume is not my favorite, but it's what I have to do right now. There you go. <laughs> Kamara Brown, it's first of all fabulous that you'll be rejoining us. We we hope by then you'll have some kind of nine to five job and you'll be able to join us here and there as a Mod Potier, mm -hmm. but still. And mm -hmm. and and I think Davy is going to be super employed in the fall, but hopes to join us here and there. And otherwise, you know, everybody is back. So what we're going to do now to start, we're going to talk about. But this, Al, what? what are you working on? Oh, me. On? Okay, I'm working on reading Madness. Okay, Zach. <laughs> I, I'm in love with this book, and I'm so ready to pick, I don't know, do a poem talk? What do you think? Do we do a poem talk on Madness? Uh, I, I think I invited Zach, uh, Zach. You're not Zach. You're Gabby. I invited Gabby recently to come east for something, and you were not able to do it because you were, I don't know, in Florida or something. But we'll have to get you back. Okay. What's that? You were on, you were on a vacay yeah. somewhere, yeah. Anyway, so this is this is one thing I'm working on. I'm also, and we're gonna I'm gonna give away this copy to the second caller. I'm also reading this book by Larissa Lai, who was here recently. It's such a fabulous book, really, really terrific book. Second caller gets this. Third caller gets a copy of this book, which is my book about 1960, which was published just right at the end of Mod Post, so I didn't get to ballyhoo it. So I'm going to give this away, uh, this copy away to the third caller. And finally, this book, which a lot of you already know about, is just now emerging. It's technically due on April 8th. A number of Modpo people wrote essays. Several Modpo people, such as Lainey Brown, were written about in this book. Um, it is very exciting. And we'll be celebrating this book. I got a call from Anna the other day, just in, so excited. Anna was actually thinking of calling in or Zooming in 
briefly in between classes. She's teaching at the Episcopal Academy High School. And uh, she was so enthusiastic. We had, we had like an hour conversation about how m much fun this was to put together. Um, and on September 21st, which is a Wednesday when we're doing a ModPo webcast in the fall, we're going to have eight people who contributed to this book here. We're, we're going to be celebrating this book. We're also going to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of ModPo, even though it's the 11th. So it's going to be, well, you know, pandemic. You just get to put it all off. Um, so we're going to be celebrating this book then, and I'm very excited. Thank you, Davey, for reminding me. Okay, so now we have a plan for this, okay? So this book, Urban Tumbleweed, is fantastic, and Harriet Mullen wrote it, and it was published by Grey Wolf Press a long time ago. And what Laney has done is, I guess with a little, uh, a little help from net with narrowing it down for me, We've picked three pages, and you all probably have printouts, and if not, Ambrose, you can share. Um, and they are tankas, or tankas, three lines. And what I'm going to ask you all to do is, and we'll do it in turn, everybody gets to pick a triplet, a triad, a single tanka to talk about in any way you want. And you can, when you get to yours, you can refer to someone who's just spoken. You can talk about the adjacency of yours to another one. But mostly what, what we're asking you to do is just put into the record your reading of a triplet. Um, I forgot to mention that the plan that Laney and I have hatched here is that we will then segment the discussion of these poems, and then we will segment the discussion of the other poem we're talking about today, the Joanne Kiger poem, and these will be entered into Mod Pub Plus. And there's new, new Mullen stuff because we just did a poem talk on Mullen the other day. All right, so let's start, let's do reverse, sorry Kamara, you're gonna be first. Let's <laughs> do a reversal of what we just did for our intros, rough reversals, so Kamara Brown first. Pick a, pick a triplet and just say anything you want about it. Everybody, there's a lot of us, so be brief, but just put it into the record. Kamara followed by Kinar. Mm, well, I'd love to start with um, the triplet, the tonka that goes with daily commuters, an extra passenger on the bus, <laughs> ladybug <laughs> clinging to the window, didn't need to pay a fare. Would you, would you um, read that again slowly as if you were sorry. reading a poem yes. at a reading? Yes. With daily commuters, an extra passenger on the bus, Ladybug clinging to the window didn't need to pay a fare. <laughs> Which I, um, I love the sort of like the turn or the surprise in the poem. Ladybug clinging to the window um, seems, you know, uh, sort of expected, but then the turn to didn't need to pay a fare. The, um, I don't know, the, the irony of even thinking about a ladybug participating in the economy in this way um, makes it uh, even more obvious kind of the, uh, the sort of harshness of paying for movement and the sort of naturalness of just going places. Um, but I also just saying I felt really I don't know, a lot of compassion for this ladybug clinging to a window. <laughs> just, I was just thinking of it clinging for its life. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've just, I've also been that daily commuter looking at the bugs thinking, damn, mm. like y'all didn't need to pay for this, but I don't think you want to be on the bus either. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Thank you so much. And it ha it's light. It, has a, it mm -hmm. has a light. It's very serious, but it also has a light side, which we're going to be coming back to again and again. Thank you, Kamara. Kinar is next, followed by Jason. So I want to look at, and this is on page 10, uh, the kind of first uh, triplet there. So pedestrians on neighborhood sidewalks swerving slightly to avoid smearing a child's exuberant drawings and mm. colored chalk. Um, nice. So I thought this was just a really wonderful and interesting moment um, that reflected sort of non-spatial or non-material uh, ways in which creation can impact flows of movement and travel. Um, across the selections for today, you know, we have different forms of like fences and then, you know, 
trees and things that kind of enact barriers, some of which are more porous than others. Um, but I liked how the actual chalk drawings in this case kind of act as almost almost sort of a, a spatializing force um, that causes this sort of swerve, um, which brought to mind for me, I don't know, I have Joan Rotelic on the mind lately, but um, she talks about how you know, poetics can sort of swerve us out of the gridlock of sorts. And it seems like in this moment, that's really what's happening. You know, people encounter this chalk and it's like, you can't quite step on on the writing. Something about it, you know, makes you want to avert it and kind of go around mm -hmm. and have that pause and that swerve. Um, so yeah, I really liked liked that passage. Oh, that's, that's fabulous. I love that. Um, we're going to go to Jason and then Lily. And then I'm going to ask Davey to come in after that with a meta moment. I'm going to ask Davy to comment on, so far, of the ones chosen, on the way in which urbanism con combines with this form, this Tonka form, which you think of as very precious and nature-y, and here it's being used in the service of urbanism. So if you don't mind, Davy, that would be a good meta moment. So Jason, then Lily, then Davy. Hey, so um, I'm looking at the one on page 11 in the middle which follows the one that Kamara the uh, ladybug. spoke about, about the lady. So the one that precedes it is, uh, <clears throat> talks about commuters and an extra passenger who's the ladybug. And if we think about it, it's probably not actually too good of a situation for the ladybug. But um, in the next one, it's from a distance, wrecked cars on the freeway our crumpled toys, the helicopter circling up above a curious dragonfly. Mm. And uh, that like there's occasional, very <clears throat> occasional grim notes or grim beats in across these. But um, I, I, the, the kind of, kind of macabre play here of the metaphor of taking wrecked cars to crumpled toys. Um, in, in a way, the metaphor kind of undermining the force of the the cars um, is interesting. Just the, the poem kind of goes back and forth in terms of scale so that we have these actual machines, the cars and the helicopter um, and the cars aren't turned into to nature imagery. They're, they're turned into the crumpled, which is not a violent word, crum really, a crumpled toys. And then uh, the helicopter circling up above a curious dragonfly, I think I really like because it's not on the page uh, each of these, that there are commas running down the middle. So um, if you take the last line by itself, it just says circling up above a curious dragonfly. And so it's, it's and it's, there's not an explicit uh, simile or metaphor grammatically. So it's not clear. Uh, so, so first of all, the, it ends with us moving into uh the kind of point of view and subjectivity of the of a dragonfly whether it's being compared to the helicopter or not but it also is unstable because it offers the possibility that you might be one might be simply observing this scene in the distance and then be distracted by a dragonfly mm. that appears yeah that's such a great reading implicitly of the lineation, the complication and ambiguity that it uh, creates. The helicopter circling up above or the helicopter. And then as you point out, the dragonfly is what's circling above. So it's, it's really a very effective as a poem as opposed to a little piece of prose observing. Thank you, Jason. Lily is next, followed by Davy with a meta moment and I'll ask Lainey and Lily, after Lily is finished, maybe while, while Lily is talking about this, Lainey, you can look at the um, YouTube comments. And then while Lainey's doing that, you, Lily, can look at Twitter. Okay. So did you pick one? 
Yes. Um, okay. My uh, uh, Tonka is on page four. Um, the second one in the little excerpt. Uh, Awakened too early on Saturday morning by the song of a mockingbird imitating my clock radio alarm. Um, and I like that one as kind of almost an introduction to the whole project because like a mockingbird outside of a urban environment, like in a, what we would think of as a non-urban nature environment, um, the sounds that they're imitating would be other bird calls or natural sounds, but the sound the mockingbird is imitating is a very um, urban, norm, you know, human life sound of a clock radio. So it's kind of asking the question, like, who is the nature and who is the non-nature in the poem? Like, if the natural element of the mockingbird is mocking a sound, that sound is probably part of the environment. But the sound it's mocking is the radio saying, like, wake up, it's time to go to work, whatever. <coughs> mm -hmm. I love that. And of course, birdsong is crucial to the tradition of poetry, so it, it does a kind of modern thing with that. Um, Lainey, before we turn to Davey, will you tell us mm -hmm. what's happening in the YouTube chat? Yeah, there's um, a lot of appreciations for everything that is everybody's pick so far. Um, we have from Jessica Weber, removal from general to specific, love it. Hannah Linden, the nearest we get to aerial views, which are also not detailed enough. Um, Jason's interpretation is always insightful. Mm -hmm. And a lot more. Thank you. That's that's great. Yeah. Hello, everybody. And, you know, if you call 610-616-3208, you don't even have to really ask a question. You'll get a book. So give us a call, 610-616-3208. Chris Martin is... is <laughs> has a, you know, a desire to talk to somebody on the Aww. phone. <laughs> <laughs> Lily? <laughs> he just said, please, someone call. L Lily, wh what's happening on Twitter? Anything? Well, I have to say it's pretty quiet, but we've got our friends uh, C.A. Knight and Ray Maxwell following on Twitter. And um, C.A. says uh, that um, it does get rather lively on the YouTube feed, which is true, but I would say... You know, come make our Twitter space lively, Monfo people. Uh, Ray says he, um, in the spirit of the plugs and announcing what you're working on, he wanted to make a plug for his chapbook of poems based on the plays of August Wilson. And he very kindly said he mailed us two copies. So oh, thanks, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Can't That's wait great. to read it. We will we look forward to that. Okay, Davey, um, I want to give you a little extra time. Um, <laughs> to do since since you haven't been around ModPo that much and it's just good to have you here. But I want to give you some time to think reflectively on generally on the urbanism and maybe in particular in relation to the choice of this form. Sure, so things that occur to me in no particular order uh, in dialogue with the four tankas that folks mentioned is that maybe starting Lily, with the one that you mentioned, thinking about relationships between like, well, what is the human? What is the non-human? Uh, these tankas for me, and especially the four that folks selected, do an amazing job of thinking about relationships between human and non-human that blur a line between urban and non-urban. And it made me think of um, the anthropologist Anna Singh and her work on arts of noticing. And that's basically, thinking about noticing or attention as a way of dealing with climate catastrophe. This is a drought landscape. This is Southern California. And this is a place in which uh, transportation is, and this is, these are all, all four that were mentioned are about routines. And the first three are about routines of movement. So uh, being a pedestrian on a sidewalk, being on a bus, uh, thinking about cars in the freeway. I mean, the like affect with which people think about transportation in Southern California is like rage and fear <laughs> and anger. And so to be like attentive and thoughtful and draw out like multimodality in what's thought of as a car landscape to have three tankas that folks selected, one about a bus, one about pedestrians, one about cars in a landscape that we really only think of as a car landscape, as only a built environment and to insist on it as multimodal, to insist on it as having complex relationships with the non-human. Uh, I mean, if the, if the tanka is a form designed to attune our attention and 
folks who are thinking about how do we deal with living with the context of climate catastrophe, one of the ways that we, one of the strategies available to us is to be like super, super, super attentive uh, as a way of figuring out how to not be in despair constantly, to like refuse the terms of grief with attention. I think about these poems doing that. I really think about them as climate poems. Uh, I think about them as in like rigorously ecological poems, especially the ones that talk about native plants that I hope we get to, get to talk about. Uh, but I also think about them as poems that ask for a routine of attention and that bring the Tonka form into living with infrastructural violence and climate catastrophe in like a very beautiful way. Yay. <laughs> really, really fabulous. And I'm sure that what you just said will resonate as people introduce more of these Tonkas. All I can think about is that Lainey and I will be sitting down a month from now trying to figure out, okay, where are the connections that this work makes to the other Mod Po poems? And I, I, you know, I really like the idea that this could intervene in uh, week three, which th the rise of imagism and all that focus mm -hmm. on focus. Mm -hmm. All right, that would be very interesting, given yeah. what you just yeah. said. Because modernism, one thing that modernism in that phase does really well is to allow the machinery and the mechanisticness of modern urban life to be thought of as natural. It's one of the things that Williams did as a reversal. Um, okay, so Allie Castleman is here. I just wanted to say hi to Allie. In case it's not obvious, what we're doing is we're each picking a tanka to talk about. But so we'll we'll give you a breather before that. Um, I'd like to turn to Gabby and then Kate to pick a tanka. Gabby first. Hey there. Um, so the one I want to pick is at the bottom of page five, um, which is why should I care about my neighbor's riotous dandelions? Mm -hmm. Does he concern himself with my slovenly jacaranda? Um, which in probably the tone I read it also sort of prefaces my comment, which is, so I think there's like this, this kind of, there's a kind of joke about sort of like not in my backyard neighbor relations, sort of Indeed. like neighbor surveillance, a kind of like envious and also kind of policing um, way that people sharing space um, behave with each other. And some of that is actually about yards in real life, but I, I think this can be sort of generalized. And the, I like what's going on with these sort of adjectives before these plants. So you have the the weed that is the dandelion, which is in this case riotous. It's standing up. It's 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 upright. It's you know it's got it's kind of glow. And then you have the slovenly jacaranda, which the jacaranda is not a weed. It's a flower, and but it, it's kind of droopy and it kind of looks a little sad when it's healthy. And so it's sort of like I have the right plant. I have the, I have the not weed but it's sort of sad looking. Um, and he has the wrong plant, but it's really, it's doing a lot of work. And so there's this weird sort of like joke about surveilling each other and judging your plants. And I just, I just find it, I actually just find it funny. Um, and that's why I like it. Yeah, that's really good. I was thinking about, you know, asking you about the Chicago yards, uh, but th there's no jacarandas in Chicago, I'm sure. <laughs> It's not a, no, there's it's not a lot of anything right now. I mean, I'll say yeah, that. That is, that is totally true. Thank you, Gabby. Let's turn to Kate, followed by Amber Rose. Um, let's see. I'm looking at the first poem at the top of page 21. Don't, pick, don't need picket fences, brick wall, or razor wire. Our home's protected by prickly pear cacti and thorny bougainvillea. Um, <laughs> I picked that one because throughout these, she's playing with borders and boundaries, containers, ways that, especially in an urban environment, we try to separate um, human and non-human forms of nature. We have traps, fences, pots, um, state borders too. Um, and in this one, I love how she's, you know, taken the containers and then, or the human container and then nature has created another around it. Like it's busted out of these sort of artificial pots and fences that we've tried to contain it with. Oh, I love that. There's a, there's a long tradition of thinking about gardens, uh, uh, particularly in the UK during the Renaissance. Uh, gardens are always both havens and prisons especially because you think of gardens in that era as emerging into private 
you know, non-common lands. Um, and this is, that's a really good example. Okay, Amber Rose, followed by Allie, and I'm gonna then invite Lainey to comment, make a meta comment on what she has heard so far from people and also why she chose this for ModPo and you know all that meta stuff. So Amber Rose followed by Allie. I'm choosing the Tonka at the top of page five. Chain link fence, locked gate protect this urban garden. Fugitive fragrance of honeysuckle mm -hmm. escapes to tempt the passing stranger. Yeah. These are all so good. Um, but this one especially, like um, like we were just like Kate was just discussing, is about control and boundaries and the sort of humorous failure of these human <laughs> boundaries, a chain link fence, a locked gate, um, to sort of keep folks in and out, right? But then there's this fugitive fragrance. First of all, to describe a fragrance as fugitive, I think is really funny. Um, but thinking about what's what what cannot be touched or seen, but still escapes um, the borders of control. And what's especially nice about the honeysuckle is that it's a fragrance, but the temptation to the passing stranger is to grab that fragrance and make it a different sensory experience, with, which is the taste. Mm. Um, so she's playing with a couple senses and how um, controlled boundaries sort of fail when you're thinking yeah. about how nature works. That's so nice. Do you have a hunch as to what kind of urban garden there is? I mean, there are two general types that one might be thinking of. One is, I have my tiny little plot of land. I mean, I myself have one such thing. And, you know, it's my, those are my tomatoes. Don't you come passing by this urban place because there's such population density and just grab a tomato. I'm going to put a fence up. And then there's the other, which Lily knows a lot about, which is a kind of collective place where it's it's actually membership slash common right sherry and for that the lock gate is well we a lot of people really collectively work hard on this and so we need to secure it at night and in that in, actually in both cases the escape fragrance is the thing you can't keep in any thoughts on what kind of garden this is amber rose and what were you thinking about the urban garden is a special special thing i think the urban garden is a special thing because it's the appeal of the urban garden is folks who recognize that the city landscape removes us from not just nature, but from a sense of cultivating nature for yes. the sake of our own benefit or for the sake of sharing, right? Yeah. But so it's sort of like the kind of folks that would have an urban garden are the kind of folks who are sort of aware of the importance of, of nature in urban landscape. But the chain link fence and the locked gate then sort of counteract that impulse to go closer to nature. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of tension here. In this particular one, I think that this is like a single person who has their garden that's really robust. It's like more than two plants, but they're mm. still like, even if I have 30 plants, mm. you can't touch a leaf on not a single right. one. So mm -hmm. do you think there's a tone here? Anybody on the part of Mullen? What's Mullen's tone, Lily, about this? Like, is she implying with this Tonka that this is a stupid ass idea? <laughs> yeah, I think exactly. Ember is pointing to the word fugitive. Like in my reading, um, Mullen is implying it with a tone of maybe irony, like um, we shouldn't really put such a heavy armament like around something so. And besides, you can't possibly as, yeah. keep uh, the smell of the fragrance, you know, at bay. You can't trap it, you can't right? Like prison it. Yeah, she doesn't believe it should be there, and like she's not saying fugitive. Like she's gonna try to put it back in there. It's like <laughs> she yeah. wants it to escape. Yeah. Yeah. And that may be, that tone may extend to many of these others. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna turn to our pal, Allie Castleman, whom I have actually seen in Philadelphia several times because <laughs> guess what? Dun -ba -da -dun, Allie is teaching an in-person course here at the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. The other day I walked through CPCW and there was Allie holding forth, or not holding forth, but you know, <laughs> leading a conversation. Hi, it's good to be here. Hi, Allie. Are you in Philly or New York? 
No, oh, I'm in New York right and, now. And and can you tell Modpo fans with whom you stay sometimes when you're in Philadelphia? Oh, I often stay with Emily Harnett. So um, Emily Harnett exists. She's doing very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking about that last Tonka that um, William Carlos Williams Williams's nose would not be deterred by that chain link, chain link fence. <laughs> um, which no. brings me, I, I hope, I don't know if anyone talked about the last one on page 21. Um, so that no, reads. No, no, day lilies. Nope. You're on. Although they grow best in sunny places with moist but well drained earth, day lilies are tolerant of many conditions and soils. Um, and so this kind of popped out at me for a couple of reasons. First, we were talking a couple of minutes ago about like where to situate um, this work, these poems, and kind of like their relation to imagism and um, the many conditions and soils just brings me immediately to mind going back to Williams of like the hospital walls and the broken glass. Um, so that's the first thing. And I also love how kind of like with that in mind to the like order and syntax here kind of introduces the flowers, the daylilies. I'm not actually sure if daylilies are flowers, are they? They are. They flower daytime. They close up at night and flower in the day and they're good almost all the way through the summer how they kind of proceed in our imagination, um, the conditions and soils. So because we're talking about a city, because concrete has been mentioned, I kind of imagine the concrete and the soil kind of like almost like claymation style, like building around mm. the flowers, which is a kind of backwards order, um, mm. but really nice because it gives, it gives the flower some kind of like precedence or um, or or relative power in that kind of like grammatical construction. Mm. Um, and the last thing I really like about how this is situated within the context of like just the excerpt we're looking at is um, we're talking about like a specific place here, but to say um, that these uh, daylilies are tolerant of many conditions and soils, it gestures outside of this particular city and outside of this particular work. So there's a way in which that um, Tonka is just really like inviting and kind of like brings in mm. um, just a lot beyond the page. Mm. Thank you. Hey, hey, Allie, had, have you thought about the possibility, <gasps> have you thought about the possibility that those words would be could be found language like on a seed packet or in a manual is it possible I, that this is borrowed I did not language? think about that although they grow best in certainly sun possible yeah I buy a lot of seed packets and it sounds like although they grow best in sunny places with moist and well-drained earth this is this is language of seed companies mm -hmm. and that would be cool Amber Rose Can I throw in a thought? yeah I that Tonka in particular is making me think Think about the tonka about the birds of paradise on five. Mm -hmm. Bird of paradise, a plotted plant in a floor in forest floors shop window. Here in my yard, it grows with no help from me. A head taller. Um, both of these, I feel like are like I'm interested in the difference between they grow best mm -hmm. in sunny places, mm -hmm. but are tolerant of many conditions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And thinking about like what are the what are the best places for these flowers to grow? Where do they do best, right? So we're gonna take them out of those environment, and they're not gonna do best, but they're gonna tolerate it. And I think yeah. that there's something we can extrapolate there about even what are our best conditions, mm -hmm. and what do we tolerate as like yeah. not our best, but we can still yeah. do okay. And what yeah. is that like extreme? Totally right. Daylilies are famous for thriving pretty much anywhere in the warm weather and you'll see along roads both urban and uh, urban adjacent roads and country roads daylilies all over the place they just sort of find their way at the edge thank you Allie. before we turn to laney for basically sum up thoughts and final thoughts and meta thoughts let's talk to somebody on the phone nope, nope. It was somebody just calling to talk to Chris, but is no longer <laughs> interested in talking to us. Okay. All right. 
Lainey Brown, the floor is yours. Uh, say whatever you'd like to say as a way of summing up this conversation and remind us why you think this is a good addition to Modpo. So a lot of words that we've been talking a lot about plants and people and intersections with the human and more than human world. And I feel like this these poems are so playful and smart in considering plants, what we can learn from plants. So just to take for an example the poem with the jacaranda and the dandelion, the jacaranda is this majestic tree with these amazing, beautiful purple <coughs> blossoms that are fragrant, but they make a mess when they fall. So they're kind of, it's kind of a grand and stately tree. And then the dandelion is so small, yet it's this really powerful medicinal herb. So I feel like in a way we're talking about people posturing through the plants and also these are, I think of these as quintessential walking poems. So Harriet writes about how being non-native to California herself, which is, she's talking about plants that are native and not native, but she's talking about herself as a transplant and walking in different neighborhoods of Los Angeles deliberately that she might not ordinarily go to with her notebook. So the poems are, um, deliberately pedestrian poems in a famously non-pedestrian city. And so to me, there's this idea of poetry as migrant, right, which makes me think about Cecilia Vicuña. They're crossing borders, we can't contain them. And in the fugitive honeysuckle, which I so love that one, um, it's all, they're also anti-capitalist. They're kind of saying, they're kind of about personal property and, and collisions between various cultures, human and non-cultures, in Los Angeles. Um, also, this book, the poems talk to each other in a way that I so love. They're in conversation with each other in the way that we are in conversation with each other in Modpo. I love that. Thank you. Snaps for Laney. Great, great summary. Um, one final thought, then, in response to that. You were implying the the word native is used at least once in mm -hmm. this book i think twice and you were implying that issue there and what you said um the one of the tankas is native or not you're welcome in our gardens mm -hmm. so it, it at los angeles is people angelinos are always thinking about who is native to los angeles whatever that would mean and uh immigration generally right mm -hmm. so this is our garden, this is one garden that everybody's, um, and native is a word that's used on seed packets and everywhere else about what is natural to a region as opposed to somewhere else. So she's obviously playing with that. Then it says, native or not, you're welcome to our garden. Lavender's dress is not so vibrant as your green trousers and purple velour sleeves. I love it. <laughs> so the person who enters the garden who might be not native basically is just dazzling like a flower. And does anybody want to guess what the green and purple uh, flag-ish thing is? Green and purple? What's the green and purple? Green and purple is Mardi Gras colors. <laughs> so this is someone who's not an Angelina, but who would fit perfectly in terms of colors in Los Angeles. I love it. There's someone on the phone, and I don't know if this person wants to comment on Mullen. I'm just going to assume not and thank everybody for our conversation about this poem. We are now going to turn to Joanne Kigers. Uh, it's been a long time as one name, one title, Notes from the Revolution might be the title, it might be a subtitle. And we're going to begin this conversation by asking Zach to play the audio of Joanne Kiger. I believe it's a fairly old audio. I met Joanne once, and she always, even to the end, sounded like this. But it is a young voice for sure. So, Zach, are you ready? Uh, notes from the Revolution is how it's listed on that page. Let's, let's do the old one and see. Notes from the Revolution. During, during the beat of this story, you may find other beats. I mean a beat. I mean campus. I mean firm us. I mean paper. I mean in the kingdom, which is coming, which is here in discovery. It is also Om Sri Maitreya. You don't crow across my vibes, but with them, losing the pronoun. 
It is thy. It is thee. It is I. It is me. Machines are metal. They serve us. We take care of them. This is to me, and this is to you. You say you to me, and I say you to you. Some machines are very delicate. They are precise. They are not big metal stampers. She made enough poetry to keep her company. My vibe. You intercepted my vibe. The long shadows, the long shadows, the long shadows. My sweet little tone, my sweet little tone is my arm. On what only? The song that girl sang, the song that girl sang, the song that girl sang. Wow, that's Joanne Kiger. Okay, so what we're going to do, everybody's smiling. What we're going to do is we're going to roughly divide the topics and I'm going to ask for random raising hand, although Gabby's going to start. Sorry, Gabby. <laughs> um, we're going to divide the conversation in, I mean, it's impossible to divide a conversation into the topics of this poem, but we're going to roughly do it. We're going to first talk about pronouns, then we'll talk about machines and machinery, mm -hmm. then we'll talk about song singing, and finally we'll talk about what revolution has to do with any of this. Okay? So pronouns, machinery, song singing, and revolution. Gabby, start us off on pronouns, and I'm going to ask Kinar and Davy just to follow up on any th quick thoughts about the way pronouns work here. Gabby, okay. sorry to spring that on you. Oh, I'm absorbing your topic list. It's like, all right, <laughs> pronouns. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think what I want to say, I mean, the, the direct line to go to, right, is in the second stanza, which... So it is also Om Shri Maitreya, you don't go across my vibes, but with them, comma, losing the pronoun. And then we get these this sort of series. It is thy, it is thee, it is me. And that kind of starts to organize the poem after that moment. But weirdly, what I think I want to do, which maybe it will be a bad task as the first commenter, because <laughs> slightly earlier to the play on the phrase cantus firmus, um, cantus firm us. Um, so here we get like a, a serious kind of pronoun play on a phrase. The cantus firmus is a musical term for when you take basically an original pre-existing melody and then you set another melody to it to create a counterpoint with it. So basically if I took, you know, row, row, row your boat and then I was singing like some original thing on it that would counterpoint with it and that created a new song. It's a very like Gregorian chant technique. But so it kind of it has this sort of idea of revolution and sort of reincarnation that's all over this poem but in a very sort of like precise technical sense but to break it into firm us cantus to have this kind of like we that sort of haunts it i don't know it does it does something and it sets us on a on a set of priorities right as this poem starts that i think are as like disorienting sort of interesting and clearly has that buddhist influence um there's my start great start thank you gabby um so i want to turn to kinar and davy just for additional thoughts or take it somewhere else i mean losing the pronoun we're not even sure what it refers to when we get there but then we get thy and thee which would be purposely antique and slightly formal and perhaps associated with uh theology and then i and me which are very different m less formal um, who, yeah, Kanar, thoughts on pronouns? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorting out the direct link to pronouns specifically, um, but I'm looking at a line between the kinds of one, the ones we've been looking at, which is, I mean, paper, I mean, in the kingdom, which is coming, which is here in discovery. Um, but it seems like in, in that moment, um, we have this kind of restaging of the firm us or the can't us, the us which can't, as in sort of sings and engages in this sort of um, rep repetition, right? That maybe dissolves particular pronouns of an individual um, into something perhaps more collective. Um, but I just loved that that kind of line and a half. Um, the which is here in discovery about the kingdom coming, I think is just an amazing, uh, way to 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 capture maybe something like prefiguration right and prefigurative political lens um wherein you know there's a world that's being built but it's being built right now um and maybe we're not there yet but there's something about this kind of uh cantus firmus i think that's being invoked um 
that is the path to that that sort of kingdom that is coming. Um, and and it has to do with pronouns. I don't have the precise connection, but I'm like, yeah, this this definitely has to do with some form of collectivity and dissolution that both kind of respects the multiplicity of people within like the cant or or whatever it might be, but um, uh, there's also just some some sort of like um, merging of voice that happens as well. Thank you. Davey, this is to me and this is to you. You say you to me and I say you to you. There's all kinds of play there and the pronouns are either faux trying to be worked out or sincerely trying to be worked out. I guess I'm on the side of faux trying to be worked out. Yeah. And the reason that I feel that way is the first pronoun that we get is the you in the first line during the beat of this story you may find other beats mm -hmm. which is to say other beat poets the but listener which, the reader possibly sure yeah you you the listener the reader but also as gabby was saying uh that is to say other melodic lines to superimpose upon the melodic line of this poem mm. and i find this to be a poem in which what is collective and what is individuated is super unstable uh, and we're signaled that first sentence uh, of like, you might think that this is a poem written by one beat, but as soon as you hear resonances with other beats, the idea of like singular authorship for someone in community, which we know that really mattered to Kiger. Kiger is like thinking in and with a communal space, a communal practice of poets. Mm -hmm. um, what is individual authorship? Uh, what is an exchange? Uh, and the other moment that helps me think about pronouns is in the third stanza, machines are metal, they serve us, we take care of them. And there are these reciprocal pairs that then comes back in the, in the next line, you say you to me and I say you to you, which is to say, if I'm addressing Chris, I say, what did someone call you on the phone? Um, I, would, I would use the second person to say that I'm in relation to Chris. Chris would use the second person to say that he's in relation to me. And that kind of relation between people is being compared to or set up as a parallel with our relationship to machines, mm. which I'm super curious as to whether people are going to say about because I feel unsure as to what to do with that. But thinking about exchange and relation is something that I think pronouns are encouraging us to do in this poem. Fabulous. Before we turn to machines, I'm going to invite Lily and Allie to comment on the machine here. I want to turn to Kate, and I want to ask Kate what she makes of I mean a beat. I mean Cantus. I mean firm us. I mean paper. I mean etc. The reason I ask Kate is because there's nobody who has thought more about what it means for a poet to say I mean <laughs> than Kate Colby. So Kate, what is Joanne doing there? And what is the meta quality of this? Shouldn't you just write a line that you mean rather than say, I mean? Because frankly, I could go around all day and say, I mean, put I mean as a prefix in front of every statement I make. And I would be simply emphasizing the fact that I mean something, which is obvious. Kate, what's your experience with this? <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> I, I, so much about this poem is, um, about um, making and blurring distinctions. And I think that's what um, the topic of pronouns is doing here too. A pronoun exists to make or reinforce a distinction. And throughout the poem, she's, she's sort of setting up and then blurring distinctions. Um, so by the time you get to losing the pronoun and the thy, the, I, me, and moving on from there, I get this very kind of Whitmanian feeling of every atom that belongs to me is good belongs to you. And so, but early on with the I means, she's sort of self-qualifying and making distinctions and making finer, um, finer points um, that she then kind of undoes. So mm. I see her doing both those things through the poem, like, making, defining things, and then blurring or blowing up those definitions. And by the end, um, just to go back to the pronouns, and I'm not great on grammar and parts of speech, but that that in the, the song that girl sang, um, it was unclear to me reading it, whether the that goes with the song or the girl. And it was interesting to hear her read it because I believe she, she emphasized the song 
that girl sang um, mm. Mm. so that the bat, you know, uh, distinguished the girl, not mm. the song. Mm. Uh, or I might have that backwards. But mm. um, anyway, I don't know if I answered the question. You but. did. And I, 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 would, I want to invite Lainey to join me in a little riffing um, on this thing of I mean, partly in deference to, in honor of Kate's fabulous book, which is called I Mean, which is a long poem, in which probably 97% of the lines start with I mean. Let's, let's do a lightning round riff, Lainey. Like, what are some of the things I mean could mean? I'll start. I mean, and that could mean I really am like a parent to a child. I am, I mean, you need to clean this room up. You're you serious. Know, you're serious. Is what, is what okay. that means. Okay. Your turn. I, I mean, mean could also mean that what I just said one sentence ago wasn't exactly right, and I'm <laughs> so I'm modifying it or I'm backpedaling right. because of the right. response I'm getting. To My I mean. turn. I mean, could mean literally and sincerely. This is I'm explaining myself. <laughs> Yeah. Your turn. Uh, I mean, could be another beat in the poem, like I'm yes. stalling for time and I don't yes. know what to say next, so I'm going to say, yes. I mean. And that might be, Kate, back to you in a second, Kate, on this, that might be what's meant by I mean, because what you do by separating be beat, cantus, firm, us, paper, kingdom, etc., is to create a beat by using a meta-poetic phrase I mean all right so during the beat of the story you might find other beats I mean a beat I mean Cantus I mean firmus I mean paper I mean the kingdom etc mm -hmm. Kate final thought on I mean before we turn to Lily and Allie to talk about machine well it also has a and, and again um, it's a kind of a Whitmanian gesture it's a it's a listing quality where it's like I mean this I mean that I mean this and I also mean right, that where right. she's collecting the world around her and right. sort of you know incorporating it into the self and vice versa. Yes, so in a way, a kind of meaning version of pointing to the world. Okay, so we have the we have machines just really appear weirdly. Machines are metal. It's almost Steinian the way this happens. They serve us. We take care of them, et cetera. How, why are machines in there, Lily? <laughs> a couple thoughts. Um, one, uh, you know, with this line that could either be the title or the subtitle, Notes from the Revolution, um, when you usually, like, colloquially in English, I guess, when you say the revolution, we kind of think about um, workers' revolutions and revolutions about so labor. So it's industrial. An industrial revolution. Um, and so that just in terms of the image association um it's very clear to see like why you would jump to thinking about machines and what they're made of metal because in a revolution you know we're we're starting with what we see and then trying to draw lines back to what it's made out of kind of mm. um and then uh was it williams who said that a poem is a machine yeah i mean he he and others of his era his generation were obsessed with turning machinery into something that should be thought of as natural yeah so i, I don't know that that's what she how she is employing it here but maybe it's a uh, there seems to be a there's a distinction some machines are very delicate and then we jump right to poetry at the end of that stanza so yeah i think she's talking about that <clears throat> idea but i don't think she's um subscribing to it necessarily. Yeah, I mean, it's got the same tone maybe as Stein in A Long Dress, mm -hmm. which talks a lot about machinery, but also about values that come and go. Thank you. Allie, a thought on why machines appear here? Yeah, I keep thinking about what Davy said about uh, reciprocity um, and the kind of like parallel between machines are metal, they serve us, we take care of them, and what's happening with the pronouns. Um, and so I guess like part of my reading of this like machine discussion, which is largely born out of confusion is, is reading the first, like establishing machines as metal is a way to kind of offset, um, or like help surprise us when she goes on to say some machines are very delicate, they are precise and what seems to be kind of like running through this is um is like some 
thought about communication um, and what's happening between the you and the me. Um, and so to end that with, she made enough poetry to keep her company, which also kind of evokes this kind of like communicating with the self. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't know. It's, um, there's a kind of like undermining of, of what she's established machines to be by the end of this discussion about the machines. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to turn to the singing, the song, the singer, the girl, and we're going to ask, good luck, Amber Rose and Kamara, on what only, the final line, the song that girl sang, the song that girl sang, and just above that, Amber Rose, my sweet little tone, my sweet little tone is my arm, and it begins with beat. So there's song, there's music. What do you make of it? I love Mod Poe because we don't know what we're going to say before we say it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I truly am unsure, but um, what I can say, so I'm going to start with my sweet little tone. My sweet little tone is my arm. And what I'm trying to put together is, I mean, the arm is what we use to reach out. It's what we use to grab things. It's what we use to pick them up to bring things closer to us. Once we start training, it's actually the legs, but that's a separate conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll um, have to learn about that. But um, here, the sweet little tone or the song is what allows the speaker to reach out and touch and interact with another person, another thing. It's, it's the physical moment of that inner relation that she seems to be kind of dealing with throughout the whole, the whole piece. Um, and my only thought, I'm really kicking the last line over to Kamara, but my only thought on the song that that girl sang, I noticed that in this version of the written text, it's twice the song that girl sang. Mm -hmm. And in the recording, it was three times. Mm. And so there was something about that final line that exceeds the like careful precision mm. of how this, how this poem is put together. Mm -hmm. And then it's really the song that kind of takes up the ideas and turns them into something that exceeds the page, exceeds precision. Um, and so that takes me back to the title that after all of these kind of moments of figuring out the relations between people, between metals, between me and you, there's something ephemeral about the song that's mm. actually what allows us to reach mm. out and touch one another. Fantastic. Really good start. Um, Zach, would you, <laughs> Kamara's like, I can't wait to say something about this. Zach, would you um, show those watching on YouTube the group view, whatever it's called? What is that called? There what we go. What do we call it? Yes. Okay. I want everybody to wave your hand if when you were thinking about, <laughs> Kanar's already waving her hand. <laughs> um, if you were, th when you heard about all the singing and a girl singing and the beat, right, and um, tone, sweet tone, there's some, another musical word in here, vibes, right? When you heard that, you first thought, oh, this is a poem. Poems are traditionally sung. The ancient idea of a poem is that it's sung. It is often a muse singing. It is often a girl singing. If you thought of that, wave. OK, a few abstentions, mostly here in the room. <laughs> Lily, we've been, of course, reading Bergvall, who was very interested in this. But does this help us at all? And then we're going to turn to Kamara. Yes, because I think. Um the <clears throat> okay so i think i i think i've got it so she talks about the machines and some are very delicate i think that she's talking about a record player in the last yeah it couple seems stanzas. to be in that last and right, also and the sweet little the tone oh, is my arm your, oh yeah your tone the tone yeah. arm is the piece Lily's that you it. um pull over to the record and then either push down or like your the button goes down and um you know if you look at a record player it, it has a certain look to it that's kind of substantial, but then if you really look at the piece that's um, reading the music itself, it's extremely small and delicate needle, um, and that can get really bent and cause really strange distortions. And so what I imagine was like, she's talking about the contradictions that that machine holds, and then those last lines are like a skip in the record, which is when 
um, that there's something kind of breakdown between the groove in the record and how the needle is pressed. So it's repeating that line wow. over and over. Wow. Love that reading. Love that reading. Um, Kamara, you have a bit of a reprieve because what's going to happen now is we're going to take a phone call. And Kamara and Jason will be tasked with responding to whatever the phone caller asks or says. Yay. And who do we have on the phone, Chris? Uh, I just want to give a quick shout out. I was talking to Robin a little bit earlier who was calling in from Maryland, but then that conversation, uh, you know, okay. we moved Okay, hello, on. Robin. Uh, but uh, we have on the line now Amy calling from Maryland also. Oh, Maryland is the thing. I know, 301. Right? Uh, props, 301. <laughs> Hi, Amy. How are you? Hi, I'm good and happy to be calling in today. That's great. It's good to hear from you. You're not so far away. You should have gotten in your car and hung out with us. <laughs> that would have been great. Yeah, you're welcome to do that. So have you been following along with this Kiger poem? I have um, also really enjoyed the Tonkas. Yeah, um, yeah. And Thanks. I had a question that is kind of just a general free-floating question. Um, when I first called in this morning, I noticed that the line here says Mod Po Live Webcast Spring 2022. And when you started talking about the Tonkas, it brought up all kinds of images for me of spring, things growing, um, coming out of the darkness. Um, mm. And I first came to Mod Po in the first year of the pandemic. Um, and so I, whenever I do mod post things, I think about how that was such a great thing for me mm. during that period of isolation. Mm. Um, and I just wondered if you guys picked these poems because they were spring-like or whether that's just something coincidental for me. Wow, I love the nexus of things you just said, Amy. That makes me very happy. You were thinking about the, the benighted fall of 2020, weren't you? And that was really... That was really hard for us. And yes, we do love spring poems. Unfortunately, the spring of 2021 didn't deliver us from the pandemic. We had to wait somewhat for 22. <laughs> but whatever. Let's just be vernal when we can be vernal. Um, before I turn it over to Kamara and Jason for uh, a response to what you're saying, um, and also Lainey, who curated the poems and might have something to say about spring, I would invite you to pick a book that we will give to you since we did promise books. So there are two options here. One, it, oh gosh, if you don't pick mine, it'll be, I'll be saved, but that's all right. Um, we have two options here, Zach. Oh, Zach's not there. We have um, this amazing book by Larissa Lai, which is a book length poem called Iron Goddess of Mercy. Amazing. Or my really dull academic book on the year 1960. Not dull. You really set it up. It's not dull. <laughs> Amy, pick one and we will mail it to you. I, I'm serious. Um, now I feel like I'm on the spot. <laughs> I really didn't want to put I'm you on sure the I spot. I, you know what? I'm going to send you both books. I would be very grateful. Are you a reader? Are you going to read? They're both books. You're going to read these? Yes. I, Great. I will read All right. Them. Will you give Chris Martin your home address um, off the air so we're not all mailing things to you and, and thanks for the call Amy and by the way stick around for the fall of 21 because it'll be our symposium mode starting on did I say 21 22 mm -hmm. uh, repeat 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 <laughs> uh, but the arm is broken Lily as it were um, yeah and so give Chris your address and we'll mail you the books and and we you can listen to our responses what after you hang up good Yes, thank you so much, Al. Okay, thank you, Amy. There. Thanks for being part of the Modpo community. Okay, so Kamara and Jason, you got kind of got off the hook because Amy's talking about Modpo in the pandemic and her experience and spring poems and say anything you like briefly, and then we'll turn to Lainey. Kamara? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really like these thoughts from Amy. Thank you. Um, it also reminds me of something I say growing up outside Chicago that like 
the first day where it's like 45 degrees or something, I remember girl, like people in middle school would be wearing out the skirts and we would just be <laughs> looking at everything and noticing spring like it was like we hadn't seen it for, for every year of our life. And it just felt different mm. um, seeing it every single year. And um, the it also that sort of story reminded me of what Davey was saying earlier about the routine of attention um, mm. that I think both of these poems kind of speak to. Um, and the last thing I kind of wanted to say is that that attentiveness to springtime also reminds me that both of these poems think about like notes and moments and specificities. Um, in a very small way um, that also sort of reminds me of springtime. Mm. And um, yeah, I really appreciated the springtime connections. Thank you, Kamara. Jason, quickly in response to Amy, and then Lainey will br briefly tell us why she picked these poems, possibly in relation to spring. And then we're going to turn to the theme of revolution and wrap up. Uh, um, Jason. Yeah, thanks Thanks so much, Amy, for for calling in. And taking that brave step and for for your questions um i think that well as someone I, I lived in tucson for a while where it was the first time being someone from entirely the east coast the northeast of, of the u.s and upper canada um it's the first time i experienced seasonlessness mm. um and and i think that for i mean since it seems pretty rooted in Los Angeles for Mullen. We, we also get a sense of a kind of permanence. It's a garden that that is ever flourishing, like due to the massive diversion of water into uh, into Los Angeles. Um, so but I think that uh, certainly the garden is a is a spring like thing, and I think that with uh, it's been a long time. Notes from the revolution. I'm really the thing that I was the word I was really drawn to is vibes, and um, I think that in terms of Mod Po's kind of power during the pandemic, kind of has to do with the Mod Po vibes, <laughs> in the sense in the sense that this poem is is talking about because I I think that like the phrase Amstri Matreya is is a mantra that's used to uh, kind of summon this prophesied uh, Buddha that has not yet come to earth that is going to usher in a kind of period of total selflessness and um, of, of non-distinction as well between people so i think that the the kind of repetition of, of vibes through the poem which is like a a kind of strangely like a is a word that like the more i pay attention to the the kids and the youth like everyone <laughs> is using the word vibes it's like a very <laughs> crisp and current word hmm. um but and the, and the verb is to vi like vibing um but vibes like music and like shadows are things that uh, they're vibrations that emanate from a person or a place or from a thing that uh, if you're in the, you know, in the circle where the vibes are present, you uh, will resonate with those same vibes. So Great. if I say, you know, oh, they have really good vibes, part of it is that I'm going to, it impacts me um, and my vibes impact you. So um, like vibes are, are, are like song or like, um, or like shadows, they extend beyond the self, um, but especially like sound, they're, they're vibrations. Yeah, there's a lot of sound here. I mean, Lily's reading helps us with that. V vibes comes from vibrations. Vibrations are sounds. 
And if you are on the same wavelength as me, which would be a thought, a 60s era thought. So in the interest of time, Lainey, I want to switch from spring, because I think Amy got a good response. Mm -hmm. And let's go to revolution. Mm -hmm. So this is, even though it was collected in selected poems in 2002, this goes back to the 60s. This uh, This is a poem that is in the style and spirit of the revolutionary time. Uh, Kiger was not only a political leftist uh, and in that sense interested in the uh, politi- p- potential political revolutions of the period, but it was also part of the count, sorry, the cultural, I almost said counter-revolution, the cultural revolution. So I'm going to ask real quick lightning round, mm-hmm. anybody just nod at me so I can see that you have something to say about this. Where do we find revolution in this poem? And how are these, if notes is to be read as musical, mm-hmm. where do we find notes, sounds, vibes from the revolution? They could be tonal, they could be idiomatic, as we've mm-hmm. been talking about just now. Jason helped us with that. Hey, you in, you've intercepted my vibes, man. Like, I was on this wavelength, but you messed me up. Okay, so Gabby looks like, yes. Thought on where you find, locate revolution, and we're all gonna make these quick. Okay, what I want to say is what's interesting about how revolution shows up here is that it's in both of its meanings of total change and repetition. So a revolution like a revolution of the planet um, or a revolution like change the society totally. And so you have things like the the Maitreya, the future Buddha, you have the Cantus Firmus, you have the sort of kingdom to come that all signal both repetition of something that has been already there and total change. And so in that sense, I feel like this is not the kind of poem that's like revolution, change everything, nothing's working. We need everything new. We need to imagine horizons or whatever. It's not that kind of a poem. It's actually Mm -hmm. significantly much more ambivalent in the sense that it actually is kind of like curious about repetition or forms of doing again. Mm -hmm. Um, There you go. Love that. Love that. And particularly when you get to, if it's the 60s and you're dealing with revolutionary politics and you start start um, valuing the sweet little tones, that's going to sound almost reactionary. Don't give me that sweet little tone stuff. Don't do little music. So th- there's real ambivalence here. Okay, I'm looking to nodders. Davey, revolution where? Where do we find it? I mean, uh, this is really just to say that, Lily, your reading changed my life. Uh, And that one place we see revolution is because this is a poem about, as Lily taught me, a record player and record players revolve uh, such that the revolution that is being discussed here is perhaps just the revolution of a skipping record, which is to say that in the second stanza, you don't go across my vibes, but with them is to say that not moving from... uh, element to element of the record, moving from uh, the various grooves in the record. A friend of mine makes records, and I really wish he were here, because he'd be able to... Vinyl? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he does. He presses them. Uh, And uh, you're losing the pronoun because the record is skipping. You don't know what the record is saying, uh, such that during the beat of the story, you may find other beats because the record is skipping. If the beat of the story is the song as it was intended, we're getting a different version of the song because we're getting it distorted. that the revolution itself, if mm-hmm. if a record skips, then the revolution it expected to take uh, is distorted, is a different shape than it was intended yeah. to be. So it's metallically metal, meta, meta, <laughs> because it's really, re- when you say, you know, you say you want a revolution, well, we all want to change the world, which is also a, an ambivalent song that also skips on the record, yeah. revolution number nine. So this is really kind of like consonant with what the Beatles are trying to figure out to do about pressing all those, all that vinyl, you know, and is that, is that the aesthetic or is that the political? You know, I really like where that's going. All right, let's take two more nodders. Lainey's a nodder. So the revolution is also in the poetry that kept her company and in the machine that could potentially print the writing that's being written but i'm also hearing it in a really like a press like printing press right Mm -hmm. um the revolution happens in song in many voices and so when one person starts with one beat that allows others to join in so once you hear the song you join the song 
So revolution is in the song, but also singing invokes the revolution. Nice. And that helps with beginning, which is to say, look, I got my revolution, you got your revolution, we're going to go round and round on this. Mm -hmm. This is what poetry does at its best during the beat of this story. You may find other beats, but I mean, and I mean, mm -hmm. and I mean. Okay, let's take one more on revolution, then we're going to have a lightning round of final thoughts. I have a scheme for us for that. So, I'm looking, I'm looking. I don't see any revolutionists. Kate, Kate wanted to say something. Kate, Kate, yeah, Kate, Kate, revolution, where, how? Oh, I wanted to return to the jettisoning of pronouns, um, and with it, the, the hierarchies, the subordinations of grammar that... Um, you know, creates this anti-capitalist pooling of phenomena that the poem evinces. So it, nice. it yeah, what she's doing on the page uh, uh, manifests this kind of combination of, of hierarchical elements. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Lainey, and thank you for choosing this poem. There is a poem talk about this poem. Um, and I, I kind of want to say that it belongs probably with the beats because that's the closest in Modpo because that's the closest we can come for Joanne. Um, and, and Joanne would not have protested much. In fact, this poem was written probably Creeley was on the other side of the room, you know, in, in that wonderful town of theirs. Um, and so it belongs there, but it also belongs across Modpo because it is a kind of perfect kind of poem that doesn't do much semantically, but is all about its poetics and what it's saying about the poem as a sound and the poem as a gesture and the poem as rhetoric. And that's what we do best here is to deal with poems like that. It is our hope that people watching on YouTube will have started thinking about this poem and thought, I don't know how these people are going to deal with this. And the fact is that scarily, we didn't think anything but that ourselves. And here we come up with something I think pretty good. So thank you. All right, final thoughts are going to be Gathering Paradise. It's going to be a recommendation of a book, a poem, a film, I suppose, a play, Something that you recommend that people read, watch, listen to. It's got to be one thing. It's got to be quick. And we're going to start with Allie and go to Kamara next. Allie, what are you reading that you recommend? Oh, I knew you were going to put me on the spot. Give me one second. You want to come back? That's fine. We can go to Kamara, who's reading a ton of stuff. Kamara? Um, well, uh... <laughs> I am uh, <laughs> reading a ton of stuff. Well, I can say what I want to be reading. My my next book to order is definitely going to be Gabe's new book. Gabby's new book. Madness. I'm definitely going to order that book. Yes, that's what I'm ordering next. That's really cool. Gabe, can you give us a one sentence? Actually, I, I could probably do it from the back of the book, but give us a one sentence summary of what the hell this crazy book is. It is a... Fictional selected poems for a fictional poet who lives from 1975 to 2036. Oh, my God. And there you go. Why wouldn't? And so Amber Rose is going to read it. Okay. Um, Allie, back to you. Uh, I just read Pure Color by Sheila Hetty. Great. Really enjoyed it. Good recommend. recommendation. Fabulous. Okay. Jason, recommendation. Uh, yeah, I just got a copy of Pure Color too, so I'm curious. <laughs> we'll talk about it, Ali. Um, and uh, Penn Sound's uh, Jack Spicer page is amazing. And there's a young uh, poet in the who, who's kind of a a, a good uh, who's like Jack Spicer, whose name is uh, Michael Chang who's uh, a young queer poet who would pair uh, nicely with Gabe's book. That's great. That was great. Zuzganian, Zuzganian. You got three in there, Jason. That was a <laughs> classic Zuzganian move. Very slick. Right. OK, Kate, recommendation, book, poet, film. Yeah, I've been reading this book, Feeling and Knowing by Antonio Damasio, which is a neuroscientific treatment of consciousness but it's also very um poetic and dumbed down to a degree that i can read it um and i love it and i've written a lot of poems from it thank you kate great recommendation i see people all over uh writing these things down gabby 
Yeah, I just read um, Stephen Ira's chapbook called Chasers, which is a poetry chapbook about desire between cis and trans gay men. Um, it's good, it's anxious, it's smart, it's sexy, it's a good book. Fabulous, okay. Lainey Brown, recommendation? I'm gonna recommend a film. It's called Drive My Car. It's a, it's a Japanese film that is amazing. And I don't wanna say much more about it except that it does involve Chekhov and it does involve <laughs> all of the actors on stage performing each in a different language. Wow. It's amazing. Very cool, thank you. Lily? Uh, well, some of you may know that I broke my arm recently and I'm healing from that. Um, and this is gonna sound very strange, but I, my recommendation is if you are a Twin Peaks fan but had been holding off on watching The Return, <laughs> um, that's been my broken arm healing show. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say I highly recommend it. I felt very strongly when I was uh, in the hospital and they were putting my dislocated shoulder back that what I saw was the episode of the um, White Sands nuclear test and that that was appearing in front of my eyes. So I don't know if that's an endorsement of the TV show or not, but I would say definitely check it out. It's really good. <laughs> and congratulations, you're not yeah, check you're it out. not in a sling today. <laughs> look, wa oh, yeah. wa wave that look how high that hand goes. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> oh, Lily, welcome back to the mobile. <laughs> Thank you. Amber Rose, certified Amber Rose. Is this going to be hard when I start to having my sessions? No. It's going to be okay. It's going to be great. You're going to dumb it down for an old person? I'm not going to dumb it down. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to make it accessible and you're going to excel and then it'll get really hard in a couple months. Oh god, I'm so scared. <laughs> you have no idea how scared I am. Listen, Al's going to have new hips by the time we're done. <laughs> okay. My gathering paradise. <laughs> oh, I've never been so embarrassed. No, hips, I'm telling you, the power is from the hips, the longevity. It, the, like the as you key. get old as you get older, you lose the power in your hips. And that's where like when you run, when you're about to fall, yeah, yeah. all that is generated from the hips. I'm telling oh you. God. So Lily's it, gonna have a new shoulder well, in about we, a year. We went running the other day, four miles, and I was well worried about my feet. And now you're telling me I shouldn't worry about my feet. It's the hips. It's the hips. Okay, thanks. But the hips are connected to the big toe. Okay, anyway. <laughs> my gathering paradise, my recommendation is for um a novel um called All the Water I've Seen Is Running by Elias Rodriguez who is a dear friend of mine and a fantastic writer, and I have not read a novel in about a year and a half, and I'm reading it right now, and it feels so good to slow down with a good book. Yay. I like slow down. Davey? I'm going to recommend uh, a book that is technically an academic book, but it is not written for academics. It is written with a, a lot of... Um, Hesitations about academic writing. It's a book called Anxious Experts by an anthropologist named Joshua Moses, uh, who is a devoted reader of modern and contemporary US poetry. And so it is a book basically thinking about spiritual care and mental health in the context of climate crisis and what it means to be a, he did an ethnography of folks who do uh, mental health care work uh, with people experiencing climate anxiety, as many folks are, uh, and where he turns over and over again in the book is to poets. The first chapter opens with a Wallace Stevens epigraph. And I think that mm. he's kind of thinking with us. Uh, and so I've been enjoying thinking with him. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to quite pull a Jason, a Zuzganian, <laughs> but because uh, that was three, I'm going to do two. Uh, first, I'm going to recommend a brand new book that's just coming out by Cambridge University Press, written by Wendy Bach, B A C H, who is a law professor. Uh, at the University of Tennessee Law School, who is visiting us here at the Writer's House on the 31st of March, and that will be a noontime program which you can watch on YouTube or come, and I'm gonna I'm, have the honor of hosting this. So Wendy has just been, written a study of a law that was passed in Tennessee. Uh, it only survived, fortunately, for two or three years. And this law criminalized women who um, because of drug addiction, had a, the drug had a relationship to the baby in utero, the fetus. Uh, and they were criminalized for this. Uh, that is to say, the idea was 
the right, the conservatives in Tennessee felt that the only way to get these women care is to criminalize that care by making it a punishment. When you go to jail, you would get the care to deal with your drug addiction. Just the, the most astonishingly wrong-headed approach that fortunately only lasted three years. And so what Wendy has done is interviewed a lot of these women who went through this process and lawyers who defended them. And it's the first narrative study of this. Uh, did you know about this book? It's, an, it's totally amazing. Prosecuting Poverty, Criminalizing Care is the name of the book. And the second one, um, second recommendation is uh, <laughs> my daughter, Hannah, who is uh, next Monday is coming back to Philadelphia to take the job, uh, succeeding a dear friend of Lily's as the food editor of Philadelphia Magazine. And so I'm recommending Philadelphia Magazine, at least the food section of Philadelphia <laughs> Magazine, and watch as Hannah continues the tradition that Lily's friend Alex started. What, Amber Rose? I said, all oh, proud dad. Proud dad. Proud dad, and also proud, proud co-convener of Modpo. Chris, thank you. Zach, thank you. Everyone, thank you. Thanks to those who were looking at a webcast for the first time. What the hell was this thing? It's so unusual. We'll be back in early September for a week one webcast. We're very excited about 20, Modpo 2022. Don't forget, September 21st, we're going to be celebrating the launch of this book, and we're also going to be celebrating the 10th, but it's actually 11th. Uh, year of Modpo. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Lainey, for curating these poems, and we'll see you in September or sooner. <laughs>